you guys all sit on that side and we sit on this side? Say again? How come you guys are all on that side and I'm on this side? <laughs> it's so that I can look at this side. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think we can start. Um, so it's great to have Brian Shrew again. Um, Brian uh, is now at Slack, but before was a student at Harvard with Lisa Rennell and uh, then moved to PI, the Institute for a postdoc, and finally last fall joined Slack. So please. Great. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I feel like I was just here like the other day, but apparently it was a whole year ago. So um, then I was talking about some more uh, model building type of work I was doing. And this talk is going to be more focused on um, phenomenology, in particular collider phenomenology, and what we can do at colliders like the LHC uh, to improve our prospects, even for looking at physics that is at or even well below the weak scale. Before we get to that. Uh, what's, of course, very exciting right now is the fact that the LHC the past year has been running at 13 TeV, and we're really exploring a new energy frontier. Um, and if you look at the kinds of uh, plots that came out of the December release, we see that we're sensitive to new physics now at the 6 to 7 TeV scale, which is pretty incredible considering that was uh, essentially the hydronic center of mass energy that we were operating on before. And what's nice about going to higher energy is that uh, we could discover something new at any time. So for instance, whoops, sorry, I took a minute to go up. So for instance, people are excited about this possible bump. You know, is it a bump? Is it a statistical fluctuation? But uh, what this shows is that even with a relatively small amount of data, have about a sixth of the data, say, of uh, the ATV run, we can really start probing new physics. And the reason why we expect there to be new physics at high scales is because of the famous naturalness problem that new heavy particles tend to destabilize the weak scale. And so we have this belief that there should be some new particles that help make it better. However, if we look at the current status, uh, things are not so great except for the diphoton. The diphoton is very exciting, but it might not, it doesn't seem to fit really neatly into any of our solutions to the hierarchy problem. And if we look at, say, uh, showing results for supersymmetry here, and the, the channels themselves are blurry, but what you're seeing is that uh, in addition to not really seeing any signals, we're seeing constraints on, uh, say, colored superpartners at the 1.5 to 1.7 TeV scale, and the LHCs continue to push further. If we look at indirect probes, you know, something that fixes the hierarchy problem is also going to couple to the Higgs somehow, and we see uh, all of the Higgs couplings <laughs> basically within the prediction of the standard model, which is very remarkable considering the, the possible range of things that we could have seen. So um, there's no reason to get pessimistic yet, but so far in our running, we've not seen uh, the kinds of physics that we expected from, say, solutions to the hierarchy problem. Now, maybe it's just we were running at too low energy, and so when we upgrade to this higher energy, then suddenly maybe we'll start seeing uh, new physics. And it should be relatively easy to find new high-mass physics. We have objects that are multi-TEV decaying into jets and leptons, and it should basically just jump out of the page at us, like the Dyson resonance did. Uh, but what we see in this plot is that diminishing returns start setting in fairly quickly. That these uh, show the uh, rates for, say, productions of squarks or gluinos. Um, and what you see is that uh, as we go, say, dropping an order of magnitude in uh, rate, that really buys us maybe a factor of 10% in mass. So we're going to get this huge gain for the first sets of data that are coming out of uh, run two. But then maybe we're not really going to learn a whole lot more past that. We get sort of incremental gains. Um, and so this makes us wonder whether uh, we might be missing something in this rush to uh, just look for new high energy phenomena. And there are a lot of things that currently aren't explained in the standard model. So I mentioned one of them, which is naturalness, but there are several others. For instance, uh, there's a question of what dark matter is. Uh, there's the question of why there's more matter than antimatter. Uh, and then there's also the question of how neutrinos get their masses. And these things are all interconnected, so we're probably uh, familiar with how these can be connected, say, to solutions of the hierarchy problem. For instance, in supersymmetry, uh, the low, lightest supersymmetric particle could be the dark matter. Um, the, the new <coughs> states coming into the weak scale could allow for electroweak barrier genesis, say. And uh, there can be new uh, types of interactions that violate lepton number and generate neutrino masses, like, say, the power parity violation. But these other areas can also have connections amongst themselves that don't necessarily tie us to the weak scale in the same way that the hierarchy problem does. So for instance, maybe dark matter is somehow connected to neutrino physics. 
or maybe neutrinos are responsible for generating the matter antimatter asymmetry. And maybe the amount of dark matter that we see is related to the baryon asymmetry. <laughs> And so what we see is that for each of these problems, we don't necessarily have a definitive mass scale. And so we want to try and look as broadly as possible. And there are many well-motivated reasons to, to look for physics beyond a standard model that's responsible for these things. Uh, and of course, there are a ton more that I haven't had the chance to mention. Okay. So all of these things could show up at the multi-GEV scale, or they could show up at 100 GeV, or 1 GeV, or 10 MeV. So with that in mind, why is the LHC something that we can use to look for this kind of physics? Well, the reason is that the LHC is going to be a very high intensity machine, meaning that it's going to produce a lot of what we might consider boring objects like electric gauge bosons, um, B mesons, even Higgs bosons. We're talking about hundreds of billions to trillions of all of these objects. And so we can be sensitive to very, very rare decays of these objects. Um, and really, the LHC is the only experiment right now that is anywhere in the ballpark of being able to produce this number of these particles. So we have this possibility for sensitive to new physics, but we also have to keep in mind the LHC is a very complicated environment, that it's a machine that's designed to look at high energy phenomena. And so you know, this, for instance, is a simulation of what uh, a typical uh, min bias event, or basically where there's no hard collision, uh, when it's running in the high pylon mode. And so we need to make sure that we can catch whatever interesting physics is going on here uh, in this muck. So what this tells us is that whatever sub-weak scale physics we're going to be able to discover, it should be pretty spectacular so that we uh, are able to pick it out. And so some examples could be um, long-lived particles, things that go partway through the detector and then decay. Uh, and this is in contrast with uh, things in the standard model which tend to, to originate from uh, the collision point. Or sort of striking signatures like lots of leptons, same sign leptons, flavor violation, basically things that are, are very rare in the standard model. So um, there is some hope of looking for these things, but why might we look at this? Why is, might this be motivating? Okay. So I'll start with the, the long-lived particles. Why should we expect long-lived particles? Well, if we look at the lighter particles in the standard model, we see that they have relatively long lifetimes. So for instance, the pions tend to decay on distances of order 10 meters, um, the kaon centimeters, uh, the D and B mesons are sub-millimeter scale. And then, of course, we have some particles that decay on very, very tiny distance scales, like the J psi, which decays on a picometer scale. So what's responsible for this complexity? Well, there are a few different things. For instance, there can be small mixing angles or approximate symmetries that forbid one particle from decaying into another. Um, and so that's, for instance, why the J psi, which can decay, say, in, through the strong or, or electromagnetic interactions, decays very quickly, whereas things that decay through the weak interactions decay on relatively long time scales. And if you have a decay through the weak interactions, these light particles, that all the masses are between, say, 100 MeV and GeV, decay through some off-shell heavy state, in this case, the W boson. And so all of the lifetimes are suppressed by the ratio of some small mass to some big mass. And this ends up holding up to be true if we have some new physics that's also lying around to the GeV or 10 GeV scale. That maybe the way that it couples and decays back in the standard model particles is suppressed by a mixing angle and also suppressed through, say, ratios of the masses uh, over, uh, of the particle over, say, a weak gauge boson or an Higgs boson. And we'll see that in many different types of examples, the same sort of scaling of lifetimes shows up. And so this is a fairly generic feature to expect from new physics that's lying quite well. Why multiple leptons and lepton flavor violation? Well, if we're interested in solving these two puzzles in particular, namely why there's more matter than antimatter, uh, we have to have some violation of the symmetry that separates matter and antimatter. And this can lead to violation of all of the, the things that are preserved in the standard model, like lepton numbers. Right? So this can lead to things like same sign leptons and, and lepton flavor violation. Similarly, in the neutrino sector, we actually observe that there are neutrinos that oscillate from one flavor state to another. And so we know that at some level, there has to be this kind of behavior. And so if we have some new physics that's lying at an accessible scale, then we might expect these kinds of, of behaviors. So, um, so this is why we should care about these particular signatures. And there are a lot of different ways that new physics can couple to the standard model. And so what I want to do is introduce a uh, way of classifying the kinds of interactions with the standard model that will then show up in uh, the various studies that I do. 
So if I have some new singular particle, say it's dark matter or it's some particle that talks to dark matter, we want to couple it to the standard model somehow. And the reason why the standard model is so predictive is that there are not a lot of ways of constructing singlets out of standard model particles. So in particular, if I have a new singlet field, it can only interact with the standard model through a discrete set of what we call renormalizable portals. So for instance, there's something called the, the neutrino portal where the Higgs and the lepton doublet form a singlet and then some other particle can, can interact with that. That way, this for instance is how you can get neutrino masses. There's what's known as the vector portal, which is essentially uh, a mixing in the kinetic term between uh, the photon and some dark U1 gauge group. Okay. And once again, this is a renormalizable interaction that, that connects the sectors. Uh, there's what I'll call the Z prime portal, which is if you have some new singlet uh, field that is charged under its own U1, then if standard model particles are charged under this interaction, you just get a couple like this. Uh, and finally, there's the Higgs portal. Namely, that if I have some scalar field, I can just form a quartic interaction here. And this essentially completes the, the list. Right? And I'm mostly going to focus on these three, in part because the Higgs portal has gotten a lot of attention and continues to get a lot of attention uh, because of the importance of the Higgs boson to standard model physics. But these other portals can provide different phenomenology, but uh, still be something you can discover to life. So for the rest of my talk, uh, it will essentially be in uh, two parts. Um, the first one is to look at uh, soft signatures of at colliders of baryon and lepton number violation. And this is going to be through links with the neutrino sector. So in particular, that whatever is responsible for neutrino mass is also is responsible for baryogenesis uh, and uh, generate the matter-antimatter asymmetry. And there are two possible manifestations of this. One where we directly produce whatever the neutrino's single partner is and another where there's a new gauge interaction that couples the baryon and lepton number. And we'll see why, uh, how we can discover these scenarios. And then secondly, I'll look at the question of dark matter. And here we'll be looking at a specific scenario of inelastic dark matter. Okay. Are there any questions so far? Okay. So let's take a look at baryon and lepton number violation. And this was motivated by two of the, the, uh, the uh, features of new physics that I had mentioned in the introduction. One of them is neutrino masses. So there's, there, we see the fact that standard model neutrinos have a mass, and therefore they have to couple to something else outside of the standard model to give them a mass. And the simplest thing that you can do is you can introduce right-handed neutrinos to pair up with the left-handed neutrinos and give them a mass, just the same way that they're right-handed partners to every other particle in the standard model. Uh, and this is typically referred to as the type 1 seesaw, where we have three new singlet right-handed neutrinos that have a Majorana mass, and then they have a Dirac mass that couples them to the standard model leptons. And phi is just the Higgs field or whatever scalar is giving a mass to the leptons. And when we diagonalize the mass matrix, uh, this is why it's called the seesaw mechanism, that the mass of the standard model neutrinos is suppressed by 1 over this heavy Majorana mass scale, it times a new color coupling. And so if I make the right-handed neutrino very heavy, it makes the standard model neutrinos very light. So often we think, okay, well then these right-handed neutrinos are so heavy as to be essentially irrelevant from the perspective of low energy physics. But of course, uh, let's say we fix the Higgs field to the observed vacuum expectation value and we take the neutrino masses to be about where we expect them to be. The right-handed neutrino masses are not themselves predicted. There's some scaling that the bigger the, the power coupling to the uh, standard model fields, the larger the right-handed neutrino mass. So if I set this Yukawa coupling to be, say, 1, then I end up with right-handed neutrinos that are up the gut scale. If I set the Yukawa coupling to be 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 7, I end up with the right-handed neutrinos that are around the weak scale. You say, well, why would I set the, you know, if I can make Yukawa coupling big, why wouldn't I make it big? And the answer is that in the standard model, we see Yukawa couplings that are very small. For instance, the electron Yukawa coupling is something times 10 to the minus 5. And so if we take your power couplings that are like what we already essentially see, then we can end up with the right-handed neutrinos lying right around the energy scale where we can produce them, say, in a collider. Okay? And I should point out that actually this scaling um, is not quite predictive, that if there are additional symmetries in the problem, then you can actually get larger power couplings that are still consistent with the observed neutrino masses. Essentially that there's some approximate symmetry that prevents the left-handed neutrinos from getting a mass, and it allows us to jack up the Yukawa coupling without giving too large of a contribution. 
So essentially, you have these two free parameters, the power coupling and the mass, the right handed neutrino. Now, if beyond giving neutrino masses, I say, ah, this is a great opportunity for me to generate uh, uh, a lepton asymmetry or uh, matter antimatter asymmetry, then I also want to see what are the conditions on that kind of physics. So, a lepton asymmetry can be generated by the decay of these Majorana particles. The reason being that they're Majorana, they can decay both into say, positively charged leptons and negatively charged leptons. And so if we arrange it, it decays more often into electrons than positrons, then we can get, say, an asymmetry of matter over antimatter. Now, uh, the way this works is that you get an asymmetry in, say, the leptons and positrons and muons and that sort of thing. And then that gets transferred to the standard model baryon number because of the fact that baryon number is anomalous and lepton number is anomalous. It's only their difference that are linked. And this anomaly is only relevant at high energies. The reason is that uh, above the electric phase transition, the gauge bosons are massless. And so you can have these field configurations that change, essentially convert lepton number into baryon number. So you can say, OK, well, if I'm producing a lepton asymmetry and I want it to be converted into a baryon asymmetry, then I need this physics to happen above the electric phase transition. And so I need the masses of these particles to be bigger than, say, 100 GeV or 1 TeV. And this is the standard argument about why we shouldn't expect to see relatively light right-handed neutrinos. But it turns out this is only half the story. This is only one possible way of generating uh, electron asymmetry. And it, there's a, another complementary mechanism uh, that acts when the right-handed neutrinos are light. So if you happen to be here for my seminar last year, I spent a lot of time on this uh, mechanism of <coughs> electrogenesis through the production and oscillation of right-handed neutrinos. I'm not going to go through it in any great detail because it would take half of the talk. Uh, I'm happy to talk about it uh, uh, later as well. But the point is that instead of having a, a Meyer on a particle that decays you know, more into matter than antimatter, what you have are standard model leptons that scatter into the sterile state. They propagate and then scatter back into our leptons. And uh, this. Uh, the key thing to note here is that the kind of lepton we start with, say it's an electron, can be different from the kind of lepton that we finish with, which is a muon. Now, if there are multiple right-handed neutrinos, then this process can be mediated by different mass eigenstates. Okay. And if these interactions are out of equilibrium, if the Yukawa coupling is small, and we saw that if the right-handed neutrinos are light, the Yukawa coupling is small, then there's nothing that breaks the coherence in terms of this uh, these two processes. And so properly, quantum mechanically, we have to take the sum of these processes. And we have to say, OK, well, in this case, we have a right-handed neutrino of mass omega i uh, that is, uh, or energy omega i that's propagating. And so it picks up some phase from, say, the Schrodinger equation. This mass eigenstate uh, picks up a phase e to the minus i omega jt from this propagation. And so what you get is the interference of these two diagrams that are similar, except there's some different <coughs> phases. And the interference can lead to a difference, say, of, uh, of say, electrons scattering to muons versus anti-electrons scattering to anti-muons. And this allows for the, the accumulation of some relative asymmetry of matter versus antimatter. The important point is that it depends on some imaginary parts of the color couplings in terms of these states. But it also depends on this phase difference here from the two propagating modes. And so if I ask, at what time does this asymmetry accumulate? Well, it accumulates when this phase gets big, when the mass splitting squared over the temperature becomes comparable to the time, the age of the universe. And if you crank through the calculations, the age of the universe is given by 1 over the Hubble time, and Hubble has some factors of 1 over M Planck in there. So essentially, this gets big at temperatures much, much bigger than the masses of anything that are running around here. And so we can generate an asymmetry at high temperatures, even if the masses are very low. And in particular, if you go through the whole calculation and find out when do we have enough asymmetry, it only gives you enough asymmetry if these right-handed neutrinos are below about 100 GeV. So this is sort of the, the opposite of the, the phase of electrogenesis that we often talk about. But what's interesting is that it makes a very definitive prediction that there should be some new particles and that they should be at a scale that we can actually make them. Okay? And that's really the only part of this that, that needs to be carried forward. So, if it's below 100 GeV, yes? Sorry, can I just go back to the summary? So, the idea is that I'm just trying to understand uh, you're not telling me this is happening in, in equilibrium. 
and to not having an equilibrium. So the, the, can you just, uh, so what is the, the, the out of equilibrium process here? Um, so because the Yukawa couplings that mediate the scattering are small, this process is out of equilibrium. And that's why these right-handed neutrinos, they propagate without encountering anything else because they're out of equilibrium. They don't typically scatter against anything else. So they're present, there's some abundance of these things. So they start out with no abundance, but you can create them through an out of equilibrium process, and then some small fraction of them will rescatter. So this is sort of being, this is sort of like this sort of to freeze yeah, this fin freeze in sort of thing. They're it's being frozen in, but the process is asymmetric. And so that's that will that will also, uh, that will mean that there's some asymmetry in those guys and also in the stuff that's left that's behind correct. in the visible things. That's correct. That's okay. correct. I got it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And then if you want to preserve, I didn't want to go into too many details. No, no, but I just want yeah. to have the basic picture. Yes. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So in order for these processes not to come into equilibrium until the lepton and baryon numbers are kept separate, then uh, you need this particle to be quite blank. It has to be less than about 100. So these processes are all on-shell processes? These are all on-shell processes, yeah. And so still, so the interaction is with what? Just the, you have a transition from an L to an N. Yeah, so you scatter off a Higgs in the thermal bath, say, or it could be in the initial state of the final. That's right. So the standard model particles, they interact quickly through so the gauge interaction, mm -hmm. sort of the top you call a coupling. So they're all... Yeah, so these are all interactions with the other standard model That's correct. That's correct. Right. <coughs> and you need this to be light because you don't want the spatterons to light the sound. That's right. That if, if this process comes into equilibrium, that... <coughs> then essentially the asymmetries that are accumulated in different fields get all equilibrated and everything. But now if, you're, if this is happening below the spatteron decoupling temperature, where is the baryon asymmetry coming Right, so the point is that the process happens at T that's much bigger than mass. Right. And then the spatterons decouple, and then the asymmetry is preserved. Okay. But sorry, then, I, then I've lost the point. I'm really sorry, but that was... No, 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 no. no. And then, then why, are the, why do the right-handed materials have to be in super light in this? What's the argument again? I'm sorry, I just didn't understand the last point. Just, right. that, yeah. uh, just that if you, uh, essentially, these processes, uh, if you go into the limit where the right hand neutrino has a large mass, then processes involving the Meyer on a mass of the neutrino become very relevant. And so, you know, if you have a lot of these on shell oh, particles, sorry. You, just need to, sorry, you just need to make these things. These are, they just need to be made on shell. They need to be made on shell. Yeah, that's right. That's too that's heavy. And if they're too heavy, then you've got a, a lot of them, and then when they decay, they wipe out the asymmetry. Essentially, they need to accumulate. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's quite subtle, but it's, a, it's sort of counterintuitive because you're used to thinking that you need heavy things if you're violating the lepton number, but actually here you need the, them to be light. And there's sort of this, this reasonably strict upper bound on it. And uh, so there are a lot of different ex experiments that have energies below 100 GeV. So for instance, we have the LHC, which is colliding, of course, at, at very high energies. Um, and then there are lower energy experiments, like CHARM, for instance, that you could also use to produce these things. Okay. So in order to see how do we actually look for this at a collider, we need to know how it, it appears. So what do these neutrinos look like that way? Well, we had an interaction with the Higgs field, the left-handed neutrino, and the right-handed neutrino. And nowadays, we live in a world where the Higgs has a VEV, and so that gives you a mixing between the left-handed neutrino and the right-handed neutrino. So if I go into the mass basis, I find that there's some you know, misalignment that's essentially some mixing angle, and it's just the Dirac mass over the Majorana. And so if I use this as, a, say, a, a vertex in my Feynman diagram, so basically any process that couples to standard model neutrinos will also couple to the right-handed neutrinos. So for instance, if I have a Z that decays to two left-handed neutrinos, then some very small fraction of the time, it will also decay to a left-handed neutrino and a right-handed neutrino. Sim so this is how you, say, produce it, through decay from Zs, Ws, anything that produces neutrinos. The neutrinos themselves can also decay, so for instance, this right-handed neutrino can mix back into a standard model neutrino and decay into a W plus a charge lepton. And then this W can say go to hadrons, it can go to leptons, it can go to whatever you want to. And this W could be on or off. 
Now, because these are Majorana particles, they can also decay into a, so here, the right hand neutrino decays into an E plus and a W minus, but it can also decay into an E minus and a W plus, because there are no symmetries that are being preserved here. There's no left hand number. And so this, you might think, okay, well, this is interesting because I can have things that, that decay and violate lepton number, and then this could maybe give me some interesting culture signatures. The final thing to keep in mind is that if the right hand neutrinos are really below 100 GeV, then these gauge bosons are typically off-shell. You know, there's not enough energy to, to have them on-shell. And if we write the decay width, it goes like the usual weak decay of G Fermi squared times the mass of the fifth times some mixing angle. And you can see, well, you know, for not too small mixing angles, this decay length can, uh, this width could be very, very short, and the decay length could be macroscopic in terms of the full height. So what we want to do is express this in terms of a simplified model, which is some benchmark that we can use experimentally that kind of obscures all of the, the complicated dynamics in the UV. So in the simplest case, we can imagine having one right-handed neutrino, and if one right-handed neutrino has one mixing angle with the standard model leptons, and we're just going to pick that it mixes with the muons just for concreteness, and it's easier for us to simulate muons, but of course the other possibilities are there. If we say, okay, well, what parameter space is allowed? This is the plot. All of the shaded regions are currently excluded. So the x-axis is the mass of the right-handed neutrino going from 100 MeV up to a uh, few hundred GeV. And this is the mixing angle squared. And so um, you can see that there are a few features here. So for instance, uh, there are these kind of sharp cutoffs. These come from, say, uh, if you look very carefully, you say, oh, this is about 400 MeV. That's where the k on mass is. So, if the right-hand neutrino is below the kaon mass, then kaons can decay into it, and we can look for them in experiments that produce a lot of kaons. This bump here is just around the charm mass. Okay? That's where charm mesons can decay into right-hand neutrinos. And then this bump is where B mesons can decay into right-hand neutrinos. Here are the lap experiments, which basically have Z decaying to right-hand neutrinos and looking for it that way. And then at higher energies, we're stuck with the LHC, um, which is a much messier environment, so the constraints get much weaker. And then there's some uh, assuming no other new physics, there's an electric precision found. Okay. These lines here are projections of some future experiments. So at low masses, what's the, the only remaining gap here is really below the char mass, say between the KR mass and char mass. And here you can have, say, D mesons which decay into a muon and a neutrino that mixes and becomes a right hand neutrino, and then it in turn decays. Yeah, sorry, for, sorry, just blocking. What, what, what's, what's the precision electro weak? Um, Essentially, that it couples to the Higgs, and so you, it, if you integrate it out, then you get some some contribution to ST and U. Because up here, the, the mixing angle is about 10 to the minus 2, which means that the Yukawa coupling is in order 1. So you basically have some new fermion, and Kyle fermion that couples. Uh, yeah. So it's actually it's the T parameter. Yeah, I think it's a T parameter that it contributes to. I got it. You said lower ground thing, I can't quite read. Sorry, yeah, so so down here, this is Big Bang and Photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. This, um, the authors made the unfortunate choice to shade in this region. So this, this line is the seesaw line. So if I were to take that naive prediction of what's the value of the Yukawa coupling as a function <coughs> of the mass of the right-handed neutrino, that would be this line. So you see that actually a lot of this we're requiring the couple companies that are quite a bit larger than the naive seesaw. So we're really operating in some, some modification of the theory. And I'll get in a few minutes to how we can actually probe the seesaw scenario. And you can see there's many orders of magnitude to go over before we really reach that point. Uh, but really it shouldn't be shaded. You could, in principle, go lower than the seesaw. It just means that it, that's not providing all of the contributions to the neutrino masses. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions? I know it's kind of a busy plot, but you know, I just want to give you a sense of what are the different kinematic regions that, are, that we're probing. Um, so what's worth pointing out is that there's a proposal for uh, a new experiment called SHIP, the Search for Hidden Particles, um, which is a fixed target experiment that's proposed at the SPS beam dump at CERN, um, which basically is like charm except on steroids. There's going to be a ton more uh, uh, protons on target, and if that is accepted for funding, and it's been working its way through the channels, then it could have this, this line here. So it would do pretty well below the charm mass and do somewhat uh, below the bump. 
What's quite striking is that there's this big open gap here, right? And this is where we're above the B mass, and the only real way you can produce this is through decays of, say, Ws and Zs into neutrinos. And so the question is, if we're producing 700 billion W bosons, can the LHC have anything to say about this? And uh, through processes like this, where, say, W decays into a muon plus a right-hander neutrino, and then it, in turn, decays. So, uh, What's the, the current status for the searches at high energy colliders? Well, what's nice about uh, this particular diagram where we have a W going into a muon plus a right hand neutrino, <coughs> the neutrino decays into a same sign muon. Remember, this is a Majorana particle, so we're violating that kind of number. And then, say, the W goes into two quarks. You say, well, this is great because I have a W that decays leptonically and I can actually see all four of the final states. And so if I can tag each of these four things, I compute the invariant mass, and it reconstructs the W. And this was proposed a long time ago, and really seems to be, you know, in principle, the best way of reconstructing. You know, there's also a resonance here, where if I can reconstruct these particles, then I get the right hand neutrino mass. In real life, it doesn't work out so well, at least in the mass range we're interested in. And to see that, this is a plot that CMS showed for the invariant mass of these two muons and the two jets that it thinks are coming from the decay. And if I really believed this, then I would say, ah, all of these things should give me a peak at the W mass, which is about 80 GeV. And if you look here, then you see that the signal, which are these sort of colored regions, give you a nice bump at about 125 GeV. So they claim to be reconstructing the W resonance, but it's obvious that they're not reconstructing the W resonance. And the reason is that uh, these two quarks get merged into a single jet, and so when they take a two jet and two muon invariant mass, it pushes them off of the W. And in fact, the background are these sort of uh, shaded blocks, and the signal are these outlined blocks. They're sitting literally right on top of each other. There's nothing that you can do in this search to improve the prospects for discovery going forward. And the reason is just that the W is decaying into four objects, they all have relatively low momentum, and you can't possibly get all of them. And so you're going to miss, reconstruct the event, and uh, that's going to cause you problems. So what we said was, well, let's look at the fully leptonic decays and see if we can improve the prospects here. Okay? And these have been proposed in the case of Dirac neutrinos that are, are above the weak scale but had never been looked for in this context. So you can say, well, you know, one of the things that we are looking for is lifetime. So you know, what is, what is the lifetime of, uh, of the right-handed neutrinos? Um, and so this is the mass, and this is the mixing angle, and this line is 10 meters, this line is 10 centimeters, and this line is 0.1 millimeters. And these are objects that can be potentially uh, are, are macroscopic with respect to the LHC detector. So there's sort of two different regimes. One of them is the displaced regime, where the lifetime of the right-handed neutrino is large compared to, say, the tracking resolution of the detector. And the other here is prompt, where we can't tell that the right hand neutrino is decayed in a separate location. There's also kinematic correlation, namely that we notice that the, these particles are displaced for lighter right hand neutrino masses, and that's just because the, the width scales like max to the fifth. And if the, this right hand neutrino is very light relative to the W, then they're also going to be boosted, because the W is decaying to something that's much lighter than it, and as a result, the decay products of the right hand neutrino are going to be. If they're prompt, then they're heavy relative to the W boson, and they happen to be unboosted. And so this tells us that there should be two separate search strategies to cover this uh, type of signature. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I, I, just, I missed this point. I mean, uh, I mean, how do you know? Sorry, how do you know that? I mean, because isn't there an extra free parameter? You don't know the the the, the mixing. That's on the y-axis. Yeah. So th this completely fixes the, the decay. Well, sorry, so why is there no displaced unboosted? There would be displaced unboosted if we could go down here. But at a certain point, the LHC just doesn't have enough events okay. to cover that. All right. So in this region where we can actually probe, there's this correlation between the decay length and the, the right. kinematics. Okay. Okay. So this allows you to suppress background for instance. So let's look uh, briefly at the, the prompt and unboosted signature. And so here we're going to consider a fully leptonic decay where the W goes to say a muon plus a right-handed neutrino, and then the neutrino goes to a same sign muon, and the W goes to, to an electron. 
So what we get are three leptons, but they have this very distinctive signature that there are no opposite signs, same flavor pairs. There's no mu plus, mu minus, or E plus, E minus. There's two mu plus, and there's one E minus. And basically, no standard model process could do this directly. Z's always go into uh, same flavor pairs. There are, of course, some backgrounds. For instance, Z can go to two taus, and one of the tau, you know, the taus can go to different flavors. Or there can be uh, leptons from heavy flavor decays. Um, but this is already a very clean signature. And I should point out that if you look at, say, the, the CMS SUSY analysis for three leptons, and I say, how many events do they have in this bin? Then that actually sets a competitive bound with LEP without having to do anything at all. So even already we're getting very good sensitivity to these models, not with a dedicated search, just with exploiting this particular fact that you can get this, this final state. Okay. So in other words, yeah, they're, they're not trying to reach we construct the W, they're just counting these events. They're just counting these events, and you're already basically at where the left bound is. So that, so that suggests that if we we can use other features of the event to try and, and, uh, and do better. So for instance, if I reconstruct the invariant mass of these three leptons, what I see is an edge of the W events. <coughs> and it's quite a sharp repeat edge. So they're almost a resonance. And the reason is just that in order to have enough PT for each of these leptons, the neutrino is fairly non-energetic in, in, in these events. And so you, the signal, which is this purple, gives you a sort of big bump over the various backgrounds. Um, similarly, if we take the invariant mass of the two, of the, the minus sign lepton and the softer of the two plus sign leptons, then we expect that this should get us close to reconstructing the right-handed neutrino mass. And indeed, for a 20 GeV mass, we see, again, there's an edge here, and the events are peaked towards lower invariant mass, whereas the backgrounds tend to have a peaking towards higher events. So if we do um, an analysis where we, say, select around these kinematic features, then we get a reach that looks something like this. We are fairly conservative in our systematic uncertainty estimates. So with current data, you could do maybe a factor of three better um, than the current limits. And uh, with the 13 TV data set, assuming that the systematics of the, the uh, heavy flavor electrons improve as you're integrating, so 20% is around what they have in, in their existing analyses, then there can be improvements of order, uh, at over an order of magnitude. And this is a very low mass object. We're talking about 10 GeV objects that are decaying. And so even though the LHC is operating at 13 TV, we can still get some sensitivity to these very low. Uh, low mass things because the signature is very distinctive. So that's for the, the prompt, an unboosted scenario. The displaced and boosted is going to lie more in this part of the parameter space. So what happens? We once again have a fully leptonic decay. So here we have the W going into muon plus a right-hand neutrino and the right-hand neutrino going into two muons. I should say mu. mu. Um, in the limit where uh, the mass of the W is much bigger than the mass of the right-handed neutrino. This energy is bigger than its mass, and it's boosted. It's relativistic. And so its decay products are collimated. And so what you get is you produce one muon from the W decay, and then this right-handed neutrino propagates some distance from the interaction point, and then decays into two collimated muons. And there's going to be some missing energy that's also essentially pointing in the same direction. And this gives you something that's called a lepton jet. It's basically a bunch of or at least two leptons that are lying very close together. And they have the additional feature of it being macroscopically distinct from its particular point. Now, there, you could also get hadronic displaced vertices, but the, the, for such low masses that we're looking at, the backgrounds could be very large, which is why we're looking at the lepton signature. So essentially, what we want to look for is this. And in the standard model, there basically isn't any real However, you could imagine that sometimes there are some tracks that accidentally cross and get misreconstructed, and, and that could give you a background. It turns out that the leptonic backgrounds are expected to essentially be zero. And I'm showing a result not from a search for this, because this search hasn't been done yet, but for a related search, where they say, uh, how many leptons do we have in a displaced vertex where one of the leptons is quite energetic, it's like 50 GeV or so. Uh, the the y-axis is the number of leptons in the vertex, uh, sorry, the x-axis is the number of leptons in the vertex, the y-axis is the mass of the, the two leptons. And what you find is that if you require two displaced leptons, 
even if the mass is very tiny below the B mass, there's essentially no events. There are like two or three out of the, you know, how many gazillion collisions were happening on the LHC. So this is a very, very clean channel. Um, again, this doesn't directly map into our analysis because it's, it doesn't have this additional mu on. The kinematics are a bit different. But given that just asking for two displaced muons and not at really anything else in the event gives you essentially very low backgrounds, then we expect that this should also have very, very low backgrounds. Um, and indeed, we looked at, at existing two lepton jet searches and tried to extrapolate them to this single lepton jet search. And we found that, that taking those backgrounds, we expect less than about one event. So, so we, in, that, in that plot, there's some cut on the displacement? So, yeah, so this is requiring that the displacement be larger than, say, two millimeters, or the okay. impact parameter bigger than two okay. millimeters, and with the two light like, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this signal region is for their actual analysis, but they very helpfully showed us even outside of the signal region. And so what we see is that even at very low mass, where they were really worried about B decay contamination, there's basically nothing there, uh, which is pretty amazing. They don't even require lepton isolation in this analysis. So really, they're, you know, Putting those requirements on would, would clearly kill off these three of them. So what we did was we did a signal-only analysis and said, okay, well, how? What do we have to do to get, say, five uh, signal events just to get some estimate of sensitivity? So we use this hard prompt lepton to pass the trigger, and then we look for this displaced lepton jet, and we require a displacement of bigger than one millimeter, which is consistent with what they were doing before. And you get a result that looks like this, where uh, essentially we have um, you know, an 8 TV that can improve by a factor of, say, 5, and a 13 TV analysis that can uh, improve by several orders of magnitude. Um, so uh, this tells us that really the LHC can, in some parts of parameter space, be competitive with very different kinds of experiments by looking at very distinctive signals. Now, the problem here is that if you zoom out, you say, well, we're still very far from sensitivity to the seesaw line. These mixing angles are much larger than we expect from the seesaw. So can we actually reach that? And just very briefly, I'll talk about a scenario where we can, namely if there's a new gauge interaction that couples the barren and lepton number. So if we have a new gauge interaction that couples to, say, a barren and lepton number, then these right-handed neutrinos could have a direct interaction with that force. So we can just produce them directly by the decay of some new Z prime. And so let's say we want to actually be sensitive to the real seesaw. Well, we need mixing angle squares of about 10 to the minus 10, whereas before the best I was getting was, say, 10 to the minus 7. So having this new production mode really helps because essentially you know, if we, you know, there's, we would not need 100 billion W bosons. We'd need 100 quadrillion W bosons or something in order to be sensitive otherwise. Sorry, can I just ask? Yes. Yeah. Just, uh, so you said that you're not sensitive to the, the, the right mixing angles. I mean, in, in principle, could I find some, it, uh, it, might, it might be fine-tuned, but I could, I could just start with uh, um, some spectrum that works and just, uh, I mean, the mixing angles, what I'm yes. asking, mixing angles are in principle independent. The, mix, the mixing angle is a free parameter. parameter. That's correct. So in principle, it might be fine-tuned, but can't I find some scenarios of course, of course, and that's why we, we want people to do that search anyway that we're doing before, because the mixing angles could be that large. Right. So, for instance, if you had an inverse seesaw, basically if you have some pseudo direct structure, your neutrinos there. Well, that, that was the, the next question I was going to ask, and then there might be some special structures where, in fact, you know, there's some, some weird structure with a mass matrix. Mm -hmm. that's... There could be. Yes, yeah. that's correct. This is, I should say, is the naive seesaw. This is like if I just put in, you know, I, do, I don't add any symmetries. Can we get a sense to be even to that? Okay, where we don't need to have any new particles beyond the one that are given masses. So let's take this naive seesaw as a, as what we want to aim for and say, okay, I'm going to determine the mixing angle as a function of the neutrino mass, right-handed neutrino mass. What's the lifetime of the right-handed neutrino? So I can plot this. So here's C tau the right hand neutrinos. Here's the mass of the right hand neutrino. And what I've done is I plugged in different values for the, the standard model neutrino masses. For instance, let's say the mass is equal to the square root of, of the solar mass where it's splitting, or the atmospheric splitting. This is the bound from Planck, and this is if we relax it to be a little bit bigger than Planck. And what we see is that in, if we're in this naive seesaw picture, 
that for right-handed neutrino masses around the masses of what you're seeing at the LHC, the lifetimes also coincidentally happen to be in the range where you can see them at the LHC. They're, they're, they're sort of millimeter or, or meter scale. This did not have to be that way. It's just a numerological fact. So if we can make the right-handed neutrinos, then they should give us long lifetimes over sort of a, a reasonable range of parameters that are consistent with what we had already been, been expecting. Now, the Z prime, if it's, say, B minus L, also couples the standard model of particles. So there are other constraints, say, from dileptron searches, from dileptron searches at B factories, uh, from uh, LEP. But, you know, there are omen parts of the parameter space. In particular, there's this window around the Z mass where uh, if you're doing a dileptron search, essentially you mask out the Z, and so this new particle could, you know, by extraordinary unlock, happen to be sitting there. And what's true for all of these is that the, the backgrounds are enormous. So for instance, there's about 10 to the 5 events per GeV bit with current data sets. Uh, and so at the very best, as I increase my luminosity, the sensitivity to the rate is going to go like the square root of luminosity, and the sensitivity to the coupling is going to go like the fourth root of luminosity. So these are going to get a bit better, but not substantially better. Whereas in the displaced vertex searches, we saw that they're basically background free. They're rare, but if I can just create enough of them, then I get a scaling that goes like luminosity and not square root luminosity. So when this right-handed neutrino decays, you often get this muon that comes along through the ride, so we can trigger on that and then look for this displaced vertex. And the current searches are all background free, but they either impose some unnecessarily tight restrictions or um, are, you know, they, they require instead of two muons and a muon and an electron or something that, that reduces their sensitivity. Um, and so, for instance, this is the current uh, sensitivity uh, of a CMS displaced search, where they look for a displaced electron and a muon. And these are contours of coupling, and we see that the contours of coupling uh, in, in the mass of the Z prime and, and the, the lifetime of the right hand neutrino, we fix some ratio of the mass. So that basically if it's a 300 GV Z prime and then it's a 100 GV neutrino. This band is the one that's favored by, say, uh, uh, the, the seesaw, I use seesaw. So we see that there are some limits, but the coupling limits are quite weak. They're like 0 0.02, 0 0.04. If we go back to this bound, this plot, we see that most of those couplings are already excluded, okay, except right around the Z mass. So, what this is saying is that you could see these right-handed neutrinos with current data, but the Z prime would probably already be excluded from other considerations. What happens uh, uh, if we consider, like we say, uh, running for much longer? Now, the current searches are background-free if they get require either two displaced leptons or a displaced lepton and a displaced so what we do is we say, well, we don't know what all of the, the configuration is going to be in the high luminosity running, but if we require both of these things to happen simultaneously, since one on its own is already background free now, you're essentially very conservatively ensuring that there are going to be no background events in these channels. Um, and so because this is so conservative, you can imagine that maybe some of the kinematic or selection requirements can be relaxed. So instead of a 50 GB uh, requirement on the muon, we put a 20 GB. And that should decrease the background by a factor of few, but we, we don't think that that should be a problem. And if we do this, the sensitivity of the parameter space uh, after, say, uh, 3,000 inverse femtobarns is very good. We're reaching couplings of the order of 10 to the minus 4, which is very, very small couplings <laughs> for a new force. This is well below the current constraints. And here is 10 to the minus 3, which is already, you know, or 10 to the, uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 3, which is what the best constraint is. And so, in terms of the mass of the Z prime and the lifetime, you're covering a broad swath of territory that is consistent with the seesaw mechanism. And I put it on the same plot that I was showing before with mixing angle versus neutrino mass. Here's the left bound, and here's what the reach of the LHC would be. So I'm sorry, I should have asked this before. Mm -hmm. Your Z prime is, you're assuming that your Z prime is producing these ends? That's correct. Yeah. And, and the Z prime couplings to Ordinary matter are what? B minus L. Sorry, I had that on one of the slides. With this coupling. That's it's right. 10 to the minus 4. So there's, so this this process is actually, okay. It's a resonant process. It's a resonant I mean, process. And it's proportional. Yeah. It's a resonant process with that. But the point is that the dileptron backgrounds are so big that, that 
you would never be able to see something that's over 10 minus 4 in, in the draw you know, that, 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 that that's, What is the limit? In the, <coughs> well, if, if I just have a Z, if I have such a light Z prime. This, this one. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry to lose no, 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 it's okay. Yeah. I mean, I know I'm going through it. Uh -huh. So, so the two features are that there's this hole around the z, and currently it's you know a few times ten to the minus three. Sorry. Yeah. As you go down until very low masses in the b factor of each, you can go down, that way, but not above the b minus, or, or above. Sorry, yeah, the b minus. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, and indeed, that's my like point. Where even if we take the, the Drellian limits and scale them with the square root of luminosity, you get bounds that are maybe five times ten to the minus four over a very narrow mass range, ten to the minus three above the z uh, mass. And so we're, we're sensitive to things that are, are much smaller. And so what you find is that in this mass range, the displaced vertex ring is actually the way that we could discover these particles. And I should point out that this shift, this experiment that I mentioned before, uh, also gets a boost from the producing these Z primes on shell. And in the 1 to 10 GV mass range, they can actually reach couplings of about 10 to the minus 5. Very, very small. Mm -hmm. Just wondering if you might like, try to extend the diagrams to the new possible peak, 1.8 GV or 2 GV for the Z prime. Mm. Yeah, so I think there the signal rate is very low. <laughs> uh, but we, we could try to do that and see if there's anything. I mean, so one of the possible interpretations is exactly that the, the, the W prime goes to right here. Um, we weren't specifically targeting that, but. Um, okay, so I have about 10 minutes left. Uh, and so um, I'll at least introduce uh, how you can use these kinds of searches to look for very different kinds of physics, namely the dark matter. Um, this was work that, that came out. So I should say that this is work that is should hopefully be out soon <laughs> uh, when I can finally be in one place enough to write it up. So, uh, okay. Um, so how can we say dark sector scenarios? Can we get similar kinds of uh, physics? So we're interested in looking at, say, low mass signals. That would be than low mass, meaning below the weak scale. And say, well, there's already a lot of constraints on low mass dark matter. So here, for instance, is a limit on the annihilation cross-section or the coupling of dark matter to the standard model from, say, the CMB and indirect detection experiments. The thermal line is a few times 10 to the minus 6, 26. Then basically everything below, say, 10 to 100 GeV is ruled out. Similarly, in direct detection, if we look at the WIMP nucleon scattering cross-section, here is LUX. So this is the current limit. It's very, very strong above, say, 10 GeV. We say, well, why are we interested in colliders where colliders have a very difficult time with dark matter? Namely, that dark matter is invisible and neutrinos are invisible, and we have no way of telling these things apart. And if the dark matter is very light, then kinematically there's very little to, to distinguish these two scenarios. Uh, so, this is, of course, an unusual case where you have some extra emission that the dark matter recoils off of, and you use missing energy to, to reconstruct it. So, this is true if you have just one dark matter. But if you have more than one dark matter particle, then things get a little bit different. In particular, you can have a scenario uh, where the dark matter particles don't have a self-coupling. They only couple off diagonally relative to one another. And so this is called inelastic dark matter and was first developed uh, in order to explain some funny uh, observations by Dama in direct detection. But essentially, if I want to, say, do direct detection and scatter off a nucleus, I have to go from one dark matter particle to another dark matter particle. Similarly, if I want to annihilate in the early universe, I have to annihilate chi-1 with chi-2. I don't have any chi-1 and chi-1 interaction. And if the kinetic energy of dark matter is much smaller than mass splitting, then I'm not able to kinematically have this process proceed. I can't upscatter chi-1 into chi-2, and Chi 2 will have quickly decayed down into Chi 1, and I don't get this annihilation process, say, in the early universe, or worse to get, really. Meanwhile, we have very high energy colliders, like 13 TeV, or 100 TeV, or however much you want. Um, and that's going to be typically much bigger than the mass splitting. And so, colliders, it's very easy to produce Chi 1 and Chi 2 at the same time, but in other experiments, it's very hard. And so, this is a rare example of a dark matter scenario where it's really better to look in colliders than it is to look anywhere else, okay? So you can ask, well, how do we look for this? 
Well, if the mass splitting is very large, then the decay of the other dark sector states gives you very energetic objects, jets, leptons, and these things you can pick up fairly easy, easily in your detector. And that, that's really not a very hard thing to do. However, if the mass splitting is very small, then the, the decay of the heavier dark matter state into the light dark matter state is very soft. It doesn't give you much energy. So what you do is you do the normal dark matter production where you have, say, a monojet plus missing energy. But then when this heavier dark matter particle decays into the lighter one, it gives off a little something. It could be some leptons, it could be a photon, it could be a displaced vertex, it could be something else. And so by taking the, the usual monojet searches and augmenting them with something else, then we can get sensitivity to these scenarios. And the sensitivity is often quite good. The, the dark matter, uh, standard model fakes are often neutrinos, which basically don't interact with anything, and so you don't expect to get any stuff in this direction. Whereas here, you're getting something, which you can identify from the signal. <clears throat> now, this seems a little bit contrived, but you can actually get it quite naturally um, in a hidden sector scenario. So let's imagine that the dark sector is a lot like us. Okay? It's a dark QED, so there's a dark electron, and there's a dark photon. And this uh, QED, unlike our own, is Higgs, but okay, we know that there are Higgses in our world too, so this is not too much of a stretch. So what we see when we look at the, the interactions for our electron, say, you have the usual Dirac mass, but you can also, depending on the charges of the, the Higgs, get a Majorana mass. And what Majorana masses do is they essentially say, well, the particle and antiparticle mix with one another, so we no longer have a distinction between them. So if I take this mass matrix and I diagonalize it, what I find is that what were originally a degenerate, uh, say, you know, positive and minus charge state, gets turned into two distinct states, which have a mass that's the same as the common one, and then plus some small splitting. So basically you have, say, psi plus and psi minus, and then they mix and their masses are split. And so you get two states in your dark sector, which have this mass splitting that depends on the power coupling and the Higgs band. And what's most important is that if we write down our force rule, okay, Feynman diagrams in this new basis, we find that the gauge boson only gives an off-diagonal coupling between the two fermions. And one way that you can think of this is that uh, for Majorana particles, we know they can't have a vector coupling. The reason is that a vector coupling has a, char uh, a coupling to, say, a plus particle minus a charge to the negative particle. But if matter and antimatter are the same, you get this minus the same thing, and you, you get zero, essentially. So if parity is conserved, then you, no matter what is going on here, you always get this off-diagonal interaction. You never have chi-1 and chi-1 interacting. You only have chi-1 and chi-2. Um, and even if you violate parity, the corrections only go like the mass splitting over the mass. So um, you end up with, essentially, it, in the limit of small splitting, something that looks exactly like inelastic dark matter. So this is how dark matter talks to itself. We also want the dark matter to talk to us. So what we can do is have, say, kinetic mixing between the dark photon and our photon. And what this means is that all of the standard model charge particles pick up a little bit of a charge under the dark photon. So that I can have, say, two quarks produce the dark photon, and then they, in turn, interact with dark matter. And we're going to focus on the specific case where the mass splitting is much smaller than the masses of the dark matter, which is smaller than the mass of the The reason for this is just that this is the most predictive in terms of connecting the cosmology of dark matter with what you see inside of the collider. Okay. Um, because we're very short on time, this is just some discussion of parameterization, which is not really very important. The collider picture is exactly the same as, say, monojet production, where I produce two dark matter particles, but then one of the dark matter particles decays into the lighter one plus some electrons through the dark force. And there are, of course, other bounds on this scenario. So uh, what we end up with are plots that look like this. So the y-axis is the es essentially uh, a combination of couplings that parameterizes how strongly the dark matter interacts with us. It's the kinetic mixing square times the dark uh, alpha times a ratio of uh, dark matter mass over A prime mass. And this is the dark matter mass here. This black line is what we predict from the observed dark matter relic abundance. And all of the shaded regions are current constraints. And this is for different values of the splitting. So here, the splitting between the inelastic states is 10% of the mass. Here, it's 40% of the 
You can see it's a few features, namely that when the splitting is big, the chi-2, chi-1 annihilation in the early universe is very inefficient because the chi-2 abundance gets depleted. And so you need a much stronger coupling to explain the observed relic density. So this is already ruled out to very low. If the splitting is small, then there's a very large parameter space that's consistent with dark matter. And these are searches, for instance, uh, that Babar does for dark matter. Uh, this is a, a LEP search that is sensitive to other uh, dark photons that change the Z-mass properties. This LHC8 is uh, property uh, searches for compressed supersymmetry that happen to be sensitive to our scenario. So if you remind me, you just go back one and to remind myself, what are you uh, LEP on? Okay, you're assuming that the yeah. So this doesn't directly, so this is what we think would be a good way of looking for it, a collider. Right. Mm -hmm. This is the current constraint. So we see that for small splittings, there's a lot of open parameter space. For larger splittings, uh, it's quite, getting quite tight. So just like in the case of the neutrino, the width uh, of the heavier dark matter particle is quite long. It's suppressed by the mass splitting to the fifth over the mass of the eight times the fourth. And so just like in that case, you know, we have these small mixing angles, we have suppression by ratio of masses, we can get a displaced decay. And so this can give us displaced vertices, just like before. Because these are very low energy, we're just going to trigger and do everything the same as with the usual monojet search. Um, and then we can exploit the kinematic properties of these leptons. For instance, they're very boosted, and so they, they're delta R, they can be very close together. Um, similarly, the MET and the di leptons tend to be very close together. So if we do this search, uh, once again, essentially it's background free. I can talk more about that afterwards if people have questions. But we essentially do a monojet search and then look for a displaced vertex of muons where the muons are close together. That's basically it. And if we do that, then this is what the sensitivity looks like with LHC 13, 300 receptor bars. That here is the, the relic density of dark matter. And here uh, is the projected sensitivity of uh, a dedicated search for an elastic dark matter. So because they're displaced, you can go down to very, very small couplings and still find it in a way that other kinds of experimental probes uh, can't do. Um, and then the last point I want to make is that you'll notice that whoops, there's a big gap here at the bottom. <laughs> Namely, that once you go down to sufficiently low masses, things just get lost in the blur at the LHC. There's no way to find them. And so we can consider going, for instance, to lower energy colliders like the bar and Bell and doing the same kind of search where we look for mono photon in this case, plus missing energy, plus a displayed vertex. And what we get uh, is this, essentially, where we have uh, the, the possible projection of a displayed search of the bar, which is completely complementary to the LHC search. And then, so in this way, we can cover a big part of the parameter series. Um, I've run out of time, so I'm not going to be able to show the work in progress. But um, essentially, I've shown two very different scenarios that, in spite of the physics seeming completely different from one another, tend to point towards similar kinds of signatures. They tend to point towards uh, low energy objects, uh, displaced vertices, and multiple levels. And then in many of these cases, the backgrounds are so low, even for very low energy objects, that we can discover something even in very soft final states. Um, and you know, while we're hoping for new di photon resonances and whatever else is going on, let's also hope that we can answer some of the other questions we have about physics uh, in low energy signals. Thank you.